everyone, and welcome to the Ian Filler Memorial Library. Uh, thank you so much for coming out on this very dreary day uh, here at the library for this presentation. Um, I'm so uh, thankful and happy and excited to have Bonnie here um, for this presentation tonight. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand or we'll just save them for the end of the presentation as well. Uh, without further ado, Bonnie Humphrey. Hi. Well, thank you, everybody. And again, appreciate everybody coming out on a rainy, cold day. It seemed like it was warming up and now it's gotten cold again. So I had to get my coat back out of the, out of the closet to come today. So thank you very much for coming. Um, and thank you also for being willing to sit through my presentation. I always am looking for any excuse to talk about Japan, share my experiences about Japan, how much I love Japan, I can go on and on and on and on. So I really appreciate this opportunity for me to have a captive audience where you, you get to listen to me and my stories and hopefully you walk away with uh, something new and interesting that you've learned about this fascinating, fascinating country and fascinating uh, culture. So I just wanna start by giving a little bit of introduction about myself. So I, my family, we moved to Connecticut only about a year and a half, almost two years ago. And we moved from Tokyo. We had lived in Tokyo for about 18 years. And so it really became home for us. I'm originally from Arizona. So when we moved to Connecticut, it was, a, it was my, when we moved here, it was my first time coming to Connecticut. So it was a big, big change, but we've, as a family, we've absolutely loved it. It's been a good move for us. Um, but um, Before I moved to Japan the first time for this long 18 year stint, my husband and I, we went as uh, grad students and there was a three month kind of study abroad program. That was my first time to Japan. I was, I was 26 years old at the time and it was my first time to Asia. And so it was like this whole big world was unfolding to me. I didn't, uh, you know, everything was new. It was, it was you know, just awe inspiring and because we were grad students, there was a company that sponsored us to go on this dinner cruise. And so this is Tokyo Bay. This is this bridge here is called Rainbow Bridge. It's an iconic landmark in Tokyo. Um, and, and first, I wanted to ask, has anybody been to Japan? One, two, few? Do you, anybody with Japanese heritage? Okay. So you guys will probably know more about, about Japan than I do. So <laughs> uh, please feel free to share comments. Anybody planning to travel to Japan in the near future? All right. And this oh, is yeah. something we're going to talk about <laughs> because the tourism has boomed. I mean, it's just absolutely boomed. Um, and so it's fun to see how Japan is changing and welcoming and um, making it so much easier for, for tourists to come and, and visit this country. Um, so when we first came, we were grad students. Um, even at that time, so this was... 2003, um, 2000, no, 2001, apologies, 2001 that we were there. And even back then, there weren't a lot, there were some, in Tokyo, there'd be a few English signs, but there wasn't a lot of English navigation. Um, so being, you know, I didn't speak any Japanese at the time. And so it was really tricky to kind of figure out how to get around. Now, a lot of that has, has changed. There's a lot of English, English signage. Um, English um, in obviously hotels and cabs and places where you'll go. Um, so it's much, much easier to get around. But we went on this dinner cruise. So this is Tokyo. You can see the tower that looks like Eiffel Tower. That's Tokyo Tower. Um, designed um, after Eiffel Tower, but slightly taller, right? Every time they build a tower, it's going to be a little bit taller. And then this is Tokyo Bay. And so they have these dinner cruises that go through the, go through the bay. And you can see the night skyline. And as a young mid twenties, you know, first time to Asia, my eyes were just wide because I thought, how does anybody find a life and make sense in this big city? I mean, it just seems so overwhelming, but really fascinating as well. And so I just remember having this moment. And then as we were, after we were there for so many years, um, we actually lived in two apartments, uh, the arrows show the apartment buildings where we lived, but it became home to us. And the fascinating thing about Tokyo, which is probably the same for a lot of big cities, is even though it's such a massive mega city, it's these little pockets that you live in are tight communities. And so you really get to know the people in your community. 
um, you know, the people that would work at the post office or the grocery store or the vegetable stand, they all became part of our just normal everyday community. And so you feel this sense of belonging, even though you live in this vast kind of crazy monstrous city. Um, so this is um, a graph of tourism, right? We talked about how tourism has completely boomed. When I first moved, um, so this is 2004, when we moved to Japan for this long 18 year stint, tourism, you can see it was starting to pick up because the red arrow is 2004, but then come about 2014, 2015, it's just taken off. There's probably a lot of reasons that we can debate on why it's, it's taken off. My personal opinion is a couple of things. One, I think anime and manga became super popular. So especially among the younger generation, they started to know a lot more about Japan. But then as a natural extension of that, what happened was, is you got a lot of people going on uh, YouTube or you know, other places and posting videos of their experiences there. And one thing that I found you know, prior to kind of YouTube, I thought all these things, I like to think I'm not that old, but I really, I tell my kids, I guess I am that old because I remember life before you know, my phone or whatnot. But when I would talk with people about Japan, especially from the West or from the US, they didn't have really anything to compare it to or to visualize. So it was a little bit of a black box. And then when they would come, they were always just pleasantly surprised at what a fascinating place it is. Um, and so I think part of what Japan was experiencing is they just, you know, people didn't know what a great place it was to, to see and experience. And then with the popularity with manga and anime and it started to creep up, and then you started to have these videos posted on YouTube where people could actually see what it was like and what people were experiencing. It's just been like, wildfire since then. That's my personal opinion. There's probably a lot of other opinions out there, but that was kind of mine. You know, people, they like to come to Japan for a wide variety of reasons. I mean, there's lots of things to experience. A big one is nature. Every season has something beautiful to see and experience. They really celebrate the four seasons. And we'll get into that a little bit later in the presentation when we talk about um, the religions of Japan. Um, but this is Mount Fuji, a very iconic symbol. Um, and this is Mount Fuji, obviously, in the fall with the fall colors. These are some cherry blossoms. This is near the Imperial Palace in Tokyo. There's these big moats that go around the palace and these huge, I mean, they're just very old cherry trees and the branches extend out into the water and it's just absolutely beautiful. Um, this is the Tokyo skyline. Um, in the distance, in the far, kind of come over here real fast. So this is Mount Fuji. So you can kind of get a sense of how far Fuji is from the, from the rest of the city. And then that's Tokyo Tower. So people come to experience this, um, you know, we often think of Japan, sometimes we may think of Zen Buddhism, you know, very calming nature, relaxed, peaceful, and it is, but then I show people the map to get around and it seems so overwhelming and so complicated. Trains are a big part of the, of the uh, culture. Um, you know, kids grow up being able to ride the trains on their own, navigate the city on their own. Um, and so this becomes second nature um, as we navigate. This is mostly only the subway lines. This does not show the train lines that run through the city as well. I mean, faintly some of them, but, um, Really, you'll have the, the subway lines and then you'll have the train lines overlapped on top of it. It's, it's a massive, massive infrastructure and it's always on time. There was a few years back, I want to say maybe it was five or six years ago, um, the uh, JR, the Japan Railway, Railway Company, put out an apology because one of the trains had arrived a few seconds, like 30 seconds early, right? And it threw everybody off, off schedule for the day. So they really, it, it, it's, it's, the trains alone make going to travel and see the trains in operation just, I mean, it's, it's very awe-inspiring. I've kind of circled in black some of the main centers. Um, there's lots to see in the city, uh, but you've got Tokyo Station, Shinjuku Station. Um, 
I believe it's still considered the busiest station in the world. There's like three million people that pass in and out of there every day. Um, Shibuya, Roppongi, and then up top, Ueno and Asakusa. Up top, Ueno and Asakusa are more of the old part of the city, um, but still you'll find a lot of history throughout. Um, this is a simplified version, and this is just looking at Tokyo. Obviously, there's lots to see throughout all of Japan, um, but this is just a, a brief kind of simplified version of the map of the city to kind of get an idea of, of where things are laid out. Um, and then this is a map of Japan. I wanted to bring this up so that if you haven't been to Japan, you can kind of have your bearings on where things are. Um, you can see Tokyo and then Kyoto. Those are probably the two most popular travel destinations um, when people go. We'll also talk a little bit about the history. Um, and so that's why I've included Kamakura and Nara because they are also very popular places to visit and, and they were key um, historical places as well. So hopefully this kind of gives you uh, a lay of the land a little bit. Okay, so in this presentation today, I, I make notes, but then I don't ever I forget to look at my notes. <laughs> in the presentation today, I wanted to focus on four main things, the culture, history, a little bit of, of the language at the end, um, and then the food. And I, I, as I have put this presentation together, I kind of thought, okay, what makes sense? Like, how, how do I take all of this information and all of these things that I'm so excited to share with people and make it make sense? And I thought about all the times that I spent, I call them city hiking with my kids as we would go and explore the city. And I thought, okay, the first thing that I need to do if I'm taking my kids with me is to feed them. So on our little tour of Japan today, I wanna to start with an explanation about the food because I think the food is such a core key part of what you'll experience if you, if you go to Japan. <clears throat> okay, so there's lots of different varieties of Japanese food. I mean, who has tried Japanese food? Yeah, just shout out. What kind of things Japanese foods do you like? Tempura. Yes. Sushi. Sushi, of course. Yes. Anything else? Has anybody tried ramen? Ramen or soba? Yeah. There's lots of different types of Japanese food. Often sushi is the first one, you know, that comes to mind. It's really popular, um, definitely very popular in the States. But there's lots of different kinds of, of, of Japanese food. You can see... This here is the tempura that you mentioned. Um, it's a very light battered food compared to the katsu, which is uh, like a heavier battered uh, and fried uh, food. This here is the soba down here. They're usually noodles. They'll be served hot or cold depending on the season. This is the cold style here. Um, ramen is down there in the corner. And then this, this upper picture here it's kind of, this is the lunch style. I took this picture as, as I went to lunch with some friends, but it's a kaiseki style, which is where they have multiple courses of different dishes that are brought out. And if you go to a place outside of a major city like Tokyo or Kyoto, maybe you're in a mountain region or whatnot, a lot of times the kaiseki um, food will be designed after that um, area. So any local herbs or local delicacies, um, everything's very fresh and, and nice, just nicely done. And so depending on where you go, what that looks like, if you're near a coastal town, right, lots of fresh seafood, and depending on where you are, the certain different types of seafood, if you're more in the south or more in the north, um, and so uh, if, you, if you travel to Japan, I would highly recommend finding a kaiseki restaurant and experiencing all these different, yeah, how do you spell it? K-A-I-S-E-K-I, kaiseki. So, and there's, there's lots of, like I said, this was a lunch menu, so it kind of all comes at once, um, but a, a, a kaiseki dinner will look like that, where it'll come with the little dish and lots of different um, dishes will, will be served. Um, okay, sushi. Everybody likes to know about sushi, right? So again, there's lots of different types of sushi. I think in the States, 
this far, this far one here is often what we think about, the nigiri sushi. Um, so you've got the fish over the rice. Sushi is actually, a lot of times the people think um, in the West, we'll think sushi, we think raw fish, right? But the sushi is actually the vinegared rice. It's kind of a sweetened vinegared rice. And then it can be served with seafood or vegetables or a variety of different ingredients. Um, here you'll see the rolls. We call this maki sushi because it's maki's the roll. But we don't get the big elaborate rolls like you see in the States sometimes. Usually they're much more um, simple like this. Um, and a lot of times my kids would love to just get them as snacks at the convenience store. Um, and there's just vegetables, cucumbers or whatnot inside. This is my favorite here. This is called chidashi sushi and it's called scattered, in English it's scattered sushi, but it's the rice underneath and then various toppings on top with a mix of vegetables, seaweed, um, um, fish. This one here um, is the hand roll sushi. So a lot of times um, they'll have the ingredients out and then you pick the ones that you like and you roll it by hand. And then the top one is called inari sushi, which is like, um, it's a tofu, like a fried tofu skin. And then the, the, the sweetened sushi rice is on the inside. Again, this is like snack food for kids. So my kids, again, they go to the convenience store on their way home from school. They would buy some of those and pop them in. It's kind of... This and I should have, I, there's a rice ball, the onigiri, but it's a rice ball. Um, probably a lot of people have seen those and wrapped with the seaweed on the outside and maybe fish or um, a pickled plum or, or herbs or something on the inside. I call the, those rice balls the PB&J, the peanut butter and jelly of Japan, right? It's kind of the go-to food for kids, um, but adults eat them as well. So lots of different types of, of sushi to try. Okay, who's heard of umami? A few. It's it's really become quite popular. What any you want to throw out what you think umami is? I've heard a lot of people say it's like the taste of a tomato. Yeah, it's kind of a savory. Yeah, savory. Any other thoughts? A mushroom powder. Yeah, it's got that savory. So umami was actually developed. Um, they were in. The early 1900s, they were trying to really enrich the flavor of the ramen broth. So this is the ramen up here, the noodle soup. And they really wanted that broth to just pop. So you just, you put it in your mouth and your mouth just waters, right? And so scientists were really dissecting that, trying to figure out what is it that makes it more flavorful? They came down if you look here, this is a dried squid, mushrooms, sardines, and then kombu, which is a really thick um, type of seaweed. And they found that the amino acids from these kinds of foods then put into the, into the broth was what really gave it that flavor. And so typically, um, you know, in Japanese cuisine, a lot of Asian cuisine, they try to encompass these five flavors. So you see salty, sweet, sour, bitter, um, and usually it's spicy, but, and some of this is loose interpretation. I mean, don't think it's so literal, but that spicy in Japan has kind of been replaced with this savory of umami. And now even like slang, you'll hear kids talk about like, umami, umami, like it's, it's kind of a slang of, oh, that has umami, like it's, it's, it's it pops, that flavor pops, but it, they may not even be, speaking about food, right? I mean, it's kind of just a local term. So, but that's where umami uh, comes from. And so you'll have a lot of uh, dishes in Japan. If you, if you go someplace and you order the broth and it's a nice place where they've prepared the broth for you, just taste the broth by itself and really try to pick up the flavors because there's been a lot of effort put into getting these delicate, flavors in the different kinds of broth. Okay, um, street food. So one thing that I love about Japan is you can eat the street food and the street food is fantastic. So um, depending on when you travel, you might find a festival and you'll see um, the, the street vendors out. Um, there's lots of different types to try. This is like fried soba noodles. 
The one, the fish on the end, that's one of my favorites. It's called tayaki. It's like a pancake. And then on the inside, they'll serve like with a sweet bean paste or a custard. But you've got to eat it fresh if you take it home. It's, it's like pancakes when you make them at home. They're best when you eat them fresh. And then afterwards, they're kind of just, you know, not as good. So, but definitely give the, the street food um, a try. And also with, with restaurants, um, little tiny hole in the wall places often are some of the best places. So I know other places, you know, you travel to, you may be hesitant. Oh, it's not very big. Am I going to get sick? Is the food, the food quality and the ingredient quality in Japan is superb. And so any, any produce, anything you eat, like I said, even on the streets, the quality um, is very, very high. So you never, unless you've got allergies or dietary restrictions, right? You really don't have to ever worry about eating food off the, off the streets um, or for small little hole in the wall type places. Those are often some of the best places um, to go to. Okay, so on our tour of Japan, now that we've filled our bellies, we've got something to eat, right? Then we're ready to go traipse along. One of the things that I absolutely love, so I would drag my three kids along with me, is going to visit temples and shrines. And when you go to see Japan, a lot of what people do are visits te visit temples and shrines. Um, I've had, and you know, my fair share of visitors, there's some that come and they just are fascinated by the history and the detail and the carvings and everything else. And then I've had some visitors that come and they're like, yeah, we saw one, we saw another, and yeah, we've seen it all, right? So in, in hopes of maybe helping to not get, um, you know, easily oversaturated with seeing the temples and shrines, I thought I would explain a little bit about them um, to give some background, because I think the, the religious context as well as the historical context really helps to bring some of these very popular tourist des destinations to life. So in Japan, there's two main um, religions. There's Shintoism and Buddhism. Shintoism is the native um, indigenous uh, religion, and Buddhism was actually brought uh, from Korea via China into Japan. Um, Shintoism uh, really, well, let me explain this first. So when you look at a map, like when you go to, to Japan and you're trying to navigate a tourist map, often the temples or shrines will be designated with these two symbols. Now, you can see by this, in Japanese, this is called manji, the symbol here. Obviously, when I bring, uh, you know, a lot of Western uh, visitors, the first thing they see this, why? Why is there a swastika on the map, right? And there's this, like, kind of panic, right? This is actually a very ancient uh, symbol representing a lot of I, I've, I've researched it and it represents a lot of different, um, it can represent the sun, it can represent good fortune, it can represent the four, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, directions, north, south, east, west, like kind of all encompassing. It has a lot of different interpretations. Um, Buddhism in Japan uses this symbol and you'll see it often on a lot of their temples as well. And there's been some debate as to whether they remove these symbols because now it has such a negative connotation for people who don't have, you know, the background understanding of where it came from. Um, so I bring it up here because I think it's, it's helpful to know. So when you do travel and you see this symbol everywhere to know that this is not remnants of World War II, this dates back much, much, much um, farther and has a very good meaning and connotation to it. Um, so anyway, there's Shintoism and Buddhism. So Shintoism, when you go to a Shinto shrine, and it used, it used to be that Shintoism and Buddhism were very um, tightly connected. And then um, in history, and we'll kind of get this later on when I kind of go through the history, but they had to break apart. So this was in the mid um, 1800s, they had to break apart and, so, and separate themselves. But you'll still see remnants, like you'll go to a Buddhist shrine and you'll see a temple and you'll see a Shinto shrine on the, on the grounds. Um, so there's still a lot of commonality um, of, they're in harmony with each other. Let me put it that way. They, most Japanese would consider themselves both Shinto and Buddhist. Um, so they work in harmony with each other. But this 
These are called Tori gates. So this is a very iconic symbol of, you know, you'll see in Japan, um, these red gates, some are not, they're not always red. Some are made of stone, some are made of wood, um, some are enormous, um, some are lined up in rows like this. So they have lots of different meaning. Um, but the thought behind them is that when you pass through the gate, you're entering into a sacred space. And so you're leaving the noise and the chaos of the world behind, and you're entering into the sacred space so that you can enjoy the, the serenity and the peace that the, you know, the sacred space provides to you. Um, so, and this is kind of, uh, not all Shinto shrines look like this. This is a very traditional one from, from Issei, which is kind of the art of Shintoism, I guess you could say, in Japan. Um, but you can see with the thatched roof, to me, it looks like a bird trying to take flight. Um, so they have kind of a distinctive look about them. Because oftentimes when people come to visit, it's difficult to know, oh, is this a Buddhist temple or is this a Shinto shrine? And they get all kind of mixed um, together. But in Shintoism, um, they believe in the kami, the, the gods, and there's an infinite number of gods. And they live and dwell in nature around you. So again, it's part of the reason why the Japanese have such a strong reverence for nature, um, that they're, they're very closely tied and connected to nature and the seasons and how the natural world works, because that's where the gods reside. Okay, so this is uh, Buddhism. This is actually a picture of a Zen temple um, in Tokyo. And uh, my friend actually, her husband is the head monk here at this temple. And so she lives here. And so it's been interesting for me. In fact, I'll, I'll move to this slide here. Here they are. So you obviously see me, I stand out a little bit. And then the lady to the left is my very dear friend. Um, and so I've, I've I've gotten this inside look into um, Buddhism and their daily practice. They're just like a lot of other religions. Like in Christianity, there's lots of different sects or different groups. So in Buddhism, it's very uh, similar. There's lots of different groups. So Zen is a type of Buddhism. Um, in Japan, there's a handful more of different types of Buddhism. Um, but oftentimes people think of Zen because especially like in Kyoto with the, the rock gardens and the meditation halls. Um, and so all of those things are derived from, from Zen. Uh, and there's a lot that goes into the daily living more than just the meditation. The, that meditative practice is translated into the, uh, the cleaning and in the, in the cooking. And this is one of the things I wanted to mention. I, I, I was hoping just when I brought my notes, but I always forget to use them. A few little tourist tips. If you go to Japan, you can actually participate in some of these temple, not necessarily ceremonies, but like, for example, if you go to a temple and the doors are open, you are welcome to come inside. You can also go, just look around. Um, shoes are always a big thing, right? Some will allow you to go in with your shoes. Some will want you to remove your shoes before you go inside. So just look around on the outside if there's a shoe cubby or you see other people have left their shoes, just remove your shoes. But oftentimes if the door is open, they welcome people to come in. You can also do in Kyoto and in Tokyo, they have places where you can do the uh, meditation at the Zen temples. And if you can't uh, sit for a very long time, they'll also have chair meditation, but a monk can walk you through the process. And it's actually a very uh, kind of interesting experience to go through. So these are some fun activities that you wouldn't normally do as a tourist. Yeah. Are, are the people in front like clergy? That picture? Yeah. So these, this is my friend's husband here, and this is his brother. They both live and work at this temple. This is another monk. Um, he used to, I would, I, when I would go to practice the meditation, this is the monk that I would always practice with. And now he's at another temple in, a, in, a, uh, in the southern part of Japan. This monk also, um, I practiced with him years back, but then he moved back to Sri Lanka. So it just so happened that they were all in town when I was there. So we got this great group photo. And then the other ones are visiting. She is... Um, the monk on the end, 
my friend's husband's brother's wife, if that, <laughs> you can follow that. But anyway, they all live at, and work at the temple. So yeah, they're monks and they care for the temple. And a lot of what their work is, um, because they're cemeteries um, connected. And so oftentimes people will say, when you get married, you go to a Shinto shrine. When you die, you go to a Buddhist temple. And a lot of the cemeteries are at the temples. So they run um, the, the funerals and they care for the cemetery. And you know, this is kind of a prominent temple in the center of Tokyo. So the people who are coming are kind of well-established, old time, yeah, long history of coming to this temple kind of thing. So there's a lot of ceremony and things that they need to do to keep up the temple and people come to visit. Yeah. Asaka and Muslim, they're allowed to get married. The monks? Yes, so this is interesting. In Japan, they're allowed to get married and they're allowed to eat meat, um, which is kind of an unusual thing. So my friend in the front, he would joke with me sometimes when they would go to their um, kind of Buddhist monk conferences, maybe in other parts of Asia and Southeast Asia, you know, they get riddled a little bit because they're like, oh yeah, you guys have it easy. You can get married and you can <laughs> eat meat, but um, they, they, they don't eat a lot of meat, but yes, they can get, they can get married. And some of it's pers personal preference on whether they do or not, but they are allowed to. So, but um, yeah, so I would say if you travel, try to find a place where you can do these, the meditation at a Zen temple and participate in that. They also cook a special uh, meal called um, shoji ryori, which is like the food that the monks typically eat. Now, like in Japan, they can eat meat, but typically it is a meatless meal and there's certain kind of dishes that they'll prepare. And there's temples where you can go and, and get that meal prepared for you. So these are some of the kind of fun ways to experience the culture that aren't always on the, you know, the tourist itinerary. Um, so again, speaking about the religion, you know, it's, I like this picture um, because it, it's just kind of part of everyday life. So this is an outer gate. This is not a temple. This is a gate that's leading to a larger gate, which I'll show you in a moment, which leads to a very large temple. But this is just, I mean, there's a schoolgirl standing here, a guy going to work, um, and the temples are just dotted, and the shrines as well, they're just dotted throughout the city. So you'll walk along and you'll see this very modern city, new buildings. There's a lot of skyscrapers going up now um, because, you know, Japan has the earthquakes. So people would used to come and they would say, oh, there's not as many skyscrapers as I thought. And that was because of the earthquakes. But now the technology is such that they're, they're building these massive skyscrapers. But among this busy, bustling city, you have these little pockets of serenity with these temples and shrines. So this one here leads up to a gate. Um, and again, this is in central Tokyo. This is called Daimon. And the temple that it's in front of is Zodoji. And Daimon is actually, um, make sure we don't, I did the wrong thing here. Um, this is the oldest wooden structure now in Tokyo. It was constructed in 1622. And that was because of the war. In the war, a lot of things were destroyed. And so the gate, this is not the temple. This is just the gate. The gate itself was quite impressive to, to go see. But again, the thought is, as you pass through this gate, leaving chaos and your worries and the ails of men, right, behind, and then you enter into this, um, quiet, sacred space. And this is the temple. So this is Zojoji. You can see it's right next to uh, Tokyo Tower. This is one that I would often try to take people to because they have so many ceremonies. It's not a Zen temple. It's called a, a Jodoshu is the type, but a different sect of Buddhism. But a lot of times they have ceremonies. And so if the doors are open, we could just walk right in and you can watch the ceremony going on. So again, and if you happen upon it, don't be shy. If the doors are open, if you're quiet and respectful, you know, you can walk in and enjoy that. Um, okay, this is something, um, and I brought this to show, I don't know if people on Zoom, maybe I'll, I'll hold it up here. It's my, my, my book here. Um, this is called Goshui. And what it, anciently what it was is, um, when monks would travel from temple to temple to, to pray and to study and to worship, then they would have a seal in their book to show that they had studied that, almost like collecting a resume, right? Now it's more of a, I say tourist thing, but it's not even tourist. I have a lot of Japanese friends that collect the calligraphy stamps. 
Um, let's see if my video will work here. There's no real, there's no sound, it's just. Yeah. And you notice his cab is free, he's not resting. And what he's doing is he's, there's the name of the temple, the temple usually some positive thing, you know, kind of whatever, maybe, maybe seasonal. And then the date, what he's drawing now is. The, and so you can buy one of these books. They're all, at all the temples. Uh, not, well, not every temple does it, but the temples that do it, they'll have a book. You can buy the book and then you carry it. And each place you go, it's either $3 or $5, depending on where you go. And you can get the calligraphy stamp and watch them do it. So that's also a fun um, thing to collect, to bring home. That's a very authentic uh, thing. These guys train, the monks train for years and years to be able to do the calligraphy. So this one is happening in the Zen uh, temples, the Buddhist mm -hmm. temples? All or? different types, uh, Buddhist temples and Shinto shrines. You'll find them more in Kyoto than you will in um, Tokyo because there's a lot more tourists visiting the temples in Kyoto. So to be honest, it's, it's a revenue producer for a lot of the different temples and shrines, but it, it is a well-trained um, you know, monk that's doing the uh, calligraphy. So, and you'll, you'll see them when you enter into a temple, you'll usually see kind of a side office area and people are queued up and, you know, you just take your book and hand it to them and then they can do it for you. Okay, I'm, I'm talking too much. I need to keep going here. All right, so a little bit on the, on the history now. So again, going to visit Japan, you'll see a lot of these temples and a lot of these shrines. And I think understanding a little bit about the, the religion and then understanding a little bit about the history helps put it in context. So we're going to switch. Well, first, <clears throat> these are not all the historical periods in Japan, but I, these are kind of the main ones that I wanted to highlight. Starting here with Nana, that goes back to 700 AD. And then we get into the Heian period. What I want you to notice when we look at these different um, periods is where the capital city is. So here it's in Nara, but mostly it'll be in Kyoto and then here in, in Tokyo. So Nara, I'll switch here. If you remember, so Nara is not far from Kyoto, okay? So let me go back here. So if you visit Nara, you'll visit Todaiji, which is, um, again, a massive Buddhist temple in and of itself. The building itself does not date back to 728, but the roots and the origins of it, the history of it do, which I don't, to me, I didn't appreciate history when I was, I was a kid. And I think now as I've gotten older, I've appreciated it a lot more. So I, I find it fascinating that these places have such a long standing history. But this was the capital of Japan at the time. Um, my kids love going here because there's deer that roam around in front of the temple and you can buy the feed and feed the deer. They're harmless. And so they like to feed the deer. But Todaiji, Todaiji itself, again, I don't want to tell you the wrong thing here. Um, because I get them flipped. It's the largest wooden building in the world. But inside the Buddhist statue is the largest uh, bronze statue in Japan. So I always get those two flipped. But the statue inside is the largest bronze statue. It's massive. But this building alone is the largest wooden building in the world. So the destination itself is quite impressive to go see. So now if we flip forward to the Heian period, this is now when Kyoto is the capital. This is more of your aristocratic, artsy kind of time period. Um, if, has anybody heard of the book, The Tale of Genji? It's, have you read it? Uh, not yet. Okay. It's very big. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of, I mean, it's kind of interesting. It's, I don't know. Uh, have either of you read The Tale of Genji? Yeah. So very well-known, famous book, right? I think it's the oldest novel in the world. It's considered the oldest novel. Um, but it takes place in this time period when Kyoto was the capital in the Heian area. And it talks about a lot of this aristocratic noble life. And, you know, you think of people out sitting under the moon writing poetry and this kind of thing, right? Well, 
it was interesting. Okay, so before I get ahead, so in Kyoto, one of the most famous destinations that people will visit is called Kiyo Mizudera. It's an enormous um, Buddhist temple. You can't, the trees kind of block the scaffolding, but there's wooden scaffolding that's kind of built up on a hill. So the scaffolding and the, and the temple itself was built without a single nail. So the Japanese are, are it's amazing, the woodworking skills and the joinery that they have. And so this was built without a single nail involved. Um, obviously, again, this building does not go back to 778, but it traces its history. The, 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 the temple itself traces its history back here. So anyway, when you, when you go to Kyoto, Kiyomizudera is probably on the list of places to go. So you kind of have some context of when this was in history. But during this time, because of the aristocrats and the wealth and the money, they needed protection, security, right? So they started to employ security guards. This is now the rise of the early samurai class, okay? So these, these samurai class start to be born and created. Then when we skip ahead to the Kamakura era here, the samurai have now taken control. They are, they are the ruling class in Japan, not the emperor. So during the Heian era, it was, the, it was the emperor. They moved the capital to Kamakura. This is also the same time period when Zen was introduced into Japan. And the samurai really liked Zen because they liked the discipline and the rigid structure around it. So they grabbed onto it. Um, Kamakura itself is very close to um, Tokyo. So it makes a great day trip. It's near the beach. So you can have a beautiful day at the beach. There's also another little island. It's, a, it's close. It's just connected by a bridge. You can walk across the bridge. It's called Enoshima. And there's lots of little shrines dotted on this island. You get a beautiful view of the ocean. Um, you can go see this big Buddha, the Daibutsu. Um, but um, so this is a day, an easy day trip from, from Tokyo that you can go visit. Then from the Kamakura era, oh, so this can kind of give you a sense of where Kamakura is in relation to Tokyo. So it's just south. Um, by train from Tokyo, uh, it depends on which train you take, but a couple hours. Yeah. Um, okay, so then we go into the Muromachi period. Has anybody seen a picture of this temple before? This is probably one of the, the golden pavilion. It's King Kakuji is in Japanese, what it's called. This is probably one of the most popular tourist destinations, right? It is a, it's really fascinating. I mean, to see a building covered in gold, I mean, it's just, it's really quite impressive. It didn't start out as a temple though. It started out as a residence. So one of these um, warlords from the Kamakura era, era moved into um, the Muromachi era is Ashikaga. And he, at this time, it's kind of, it's called the Warring States period. And, and Japan's kind of broken up and there's all these different tribal warfares going on. But this guy built this an elaborate palace for himself. And then later on, it was converted into a Zen temple. You can't go inside, um, but you can walk the grounds and the gardens surrounding the temple are just absolutely beautiful. So this is a great, this is a, a fun place to go. And it's in Kyoto. Then from here, um, there's kind of the unification of Japan. And there were three main um, men that unified Japan. Japan, And then the last of whom, I'm, I'm just gonna skip ahead here um, for sake of time. His name is Tokugawa Ieyasu. And he's the one in this Edo period that took the capital to Tokyo. So that's why the capital is now in Tokyo. And during this time period, so this Edo time period, 1603 to 1867, is kind of what people think of as the samurai. So when you think of a samurai, this is kind of the time period that they come from that you would think about. Um, then from here, um, in 1868, we get into the um, Meiji Restoration. And th at this time, during the Edo time period, the samurai are in charge, the shogun. And then from this time period, the emperor is back in charge. And then the emperor has been ruling Japan ever since um, this Meiji time period. Um, this, I brought a couple of people on Zoom will be able to see. Oh, it's okay. I'll just hold it here. This uh, box 
because I like to collect old antiques and stuff. This box is actually from this Meiji time period. Um, so the late 1800s, this was a bank. And so what people would do is you drop your coins inside and it's slanted, you can come see it at the end, but you can drop your coins inside and then it's got this lock on the front. Um, and again, just the woodwork, the joinery, the metalwork, um, there's a lot of really cool Japanese antiques. I, I love this stuff. My kids keep saying, Mom, are we going to inherit all this stuff when we die? I said, no, you can sell it, I guess. I don't know. But um, anyway, that I thought that was kind of fun. But that's from the Meiji era, and that's a, a, a bank. And so they would have these traveling money boxes. Um, okay, so that kind of gives a historical context. Because then as you... And then this, I put this temple again, this is Odoji, because this was um, a favorite temple of the Tokugawa um, family, which is the ruling shogun family. And so the first Tokugawa Ieyasu, part of his remains are buried um, here. And so there's a lot of connection with that Tokugawa family right in the heart of Tokyo. So hopefully this gives a little bit of context. So when you go to see the Golden Pavilion, so these temples in Tokyo, you know, you kind of have a sense of where they were in history and what was, and what was going on. Um, okay, so I wanted to get into, so in, in Japanese, there's a term called omotenashi, which is um, hard to just encapsulate. Um, it goes with service, respect, cleanliness, the gift giving, it's this hospitality. Um, this is a part, I think, where, I don't know, I feel like I'm the most emotional in the presentation. Having lived in Japan for so many years and seeing this kind of care and respect that they offer to other people, even strangers, people that they don't know, it has changed me and my viewpoints for the rest of my life. I, it, it, it puts such a lasting impression on you on how people are, can be so respectful and so thoughtful and careful, uh, you know, and care for other people and how they treat. So like up here, there's, you know, the gift giving is a big part of the culture. Anytime I go back to Japan to visit, you know, I went back in February with my daughter and I come home, I, I know I've got to leave empty room in my suitcase because I'm going to come home with just gifts and gifts and gifts um, because it's just this, this thoughtful, uh, way that they treat people. My, I put this picture here, this where the bus where it says airport, there's a, a charter, you know, they call it airport limousine, but it's a bus that runs from the airport, you know, to, to bring you into town. There's also trains and whatnot. But the first time I arrived as a grad student um, for that first summer, you know, again, didn't know what to expect. And we got out of the airport and I'm with my husband. And my husband, he speaks Japanese. He spoke Japanese at the time. He had lived in Japan for many years. So it was kind of, he kind of was, yeah, 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 he kind of knew what to expect. For me, it was all new. I hand them my ticket. These men with white gloves pick up my suitcases, carefully put them on the side. You know, they, they take my ticket. They make sure I get into the bus. They carefully put them underneath. I'm looking out my window, you know, down watching them. They put my uh, suitcases carefully underneath the bus. And then when we leave, you know, they bow, right? And I turned to my husband and I said, I'm going to love it here. <laughs> I thought, this, this is, I thought I'd die and to heaven. Just such immense respect. And, and the city is clean. It's, it's such, it really is, like a, experiencing the culture is such a life-changing experience. At least it was for me. Um, I show the picture of the escalators. Because the escalators, you stand on one side and then let other people walk up um, to be polite. But the trick is, is depending if you are in Tokyo or if you're in Osaka, you stand on opposite sides. So you got to watch for <laughs> what, what part of the country you're in. And then this top picture, that's my friend at the temple. You know, anytime we go, she'll prepare a tray with the tea and some little sweets. to just sit, relax, have a chat. Um, and try to, again, take care of your comfort, make sure that you're comfortable. Um, so this concept really means a lot to me. Um, I kind of spoke about this at the beginning of the presentation. Nature is a big part of the culture. So whenever you go, this is another like tourist tip. 
if you're planning to obviously if you go during cherry blossom season there's loads of festivals and places to to enjoy the cherry blossoms but even during summer during fall winter there's always usually festivals going on so look for like search it up and then find some local festivals to join in and just experience that part of the of the culture also um, visiting gardens the gardens are beautiful and the gardens themselves have incredible history um, that one at the top where it says Hamariku Gardens, um, that's in Tokyo. It was an old samurai hunting ground for, for ducks. And they still have some of the old hides uh, where they would go find them. And you can see the water, it's, it's next to Tokyo Bay. And so some of that salt water comes in. So you look in the ponds and the gardens, sometimes my kids would search and you would find little um, like saltwater fish or jellyfish that would be in there that would, that would you know, kind of get into the ponds. Um, but the gardens are beautifully done. This one here um, is the oldest park in Tokyo. Um, it's from mid 1600s when it was established. Um, so lots of the gardens are definitely worth. You don't need to visit all of them, but at least, you know, check out one or two. Onsen, has anybody ever heard of onsen? Yeah, what do you, it's uh, water. Exactly. So it's, there's a lot of volcanic activity. And so the water is naturally heated underneath, full of minerals, um, things that are really beneficial for your health. And so you can go to mountain resorts all throughout Japan and you stay in like a little hotel and they'll have these um, like onsens where you can bathe and inside, outside. The men and women are separate. Um, so you don't worry about that, but, um, but you do bathe publicly in front of, you know, other women or other men. So I know sometimes when I bring Western friends over, they're always a little bit like, ah, oh, that's a little bit out of my comfort zone. But experiencing, you know, being able to sit outside in this, you know, this hot pool of natural spring water, you know, you look out on these be beautiful, like gorgeous, you know, nature landscapes. It's, it is, it's a, it's a very healing experience. I always just really enjoy, it's relaxing, it's healing, you're in nature. And then they always usually will have some a beautiful dinner for you. And then if you like, they, they oftentimes they'll have the tatami mats and the futon you can sleep on at night and you can have the whole full kind of Japanese experience. And, and that is just such a, such a treat. Um, okay, this is just a couple of pictures. I'll skip ahead here. Um, culture and everyday life. Uh, Japanese culture like things that are cute. Uh, sometimes I say it's like Disneyland for adults. Um, so this picture, um, the one with uh, Hello Kitty, that's not my picture. I pulled that off, but it's, you'll often see like every little, every town has their own little character or companies even have their characters and mascots. And so there's lots of characters and mascots. Um, so there's lots of, it's just the advertising often is very cute. Um, the this is a picture in the trains. You can see it's very quiet, um, very respectful. Um, you rarely hear people, I mean, people talk, but it's, it's quiet. It's, it's not loud and noisy, even when it's jam-packed with, with people. Um, this picture here I took, this was just a little local park close to us. And there's, you can see the kids eating their rice bowls. It's a summer day, it's hot. So they're playing in the water at the park. And then they're just sitting there eating their, their rice bowls. So again, it's a big, massive city, but yet you feel these pockets of community um, wherever you go. Um, okay, this this video I, I took and I just got such a kick out of it, so I, ha I wanted to share it. Um, this is an advertisement at the metro station, um, basically, and it's it's the Rapungi area where it's kind of a nightclub district, so you get a lot of people who, you know, they, they drunk too much and they can't make it home. So the video is basically saying, if you fall, you know, don't fall asleep in the road um, because you might get hit, basically, right? Mm -hmm. But I, which seems common, common <laughs> sense, right? But I, I like it because it's, it's just got this Japanese, almost to me as a Westerner, kind of this quirky feel to it. It's got the anime in the background with the guy, and then you'll see there's a couple of guys who will do some dancing. Um, and then they, at the end, they say, you know, don't fall asleep in the road or whatnot. So here, I'll play it for you. And <laughs> Like, don't do it, right? And then they advertise a credit card. <laughs> 
I just, I, you know, there's, it's hard to sometimes put cultural, you know, differences into words, but for me, this video kind of just captures, it's, it, it's just, it's just different. It's not something you necessarily see in the States, but it's, it's so uniquely Japan to me. Um, um, okay, and then just school life, like I mentioned before, you know, kids will ride the trains on their own. I remember my sister-in-law came once and we were in, uh, we were going to Shibuya, which is a very crowded, it's that scramble crossing if you've seen that on video. So the trains are packed like this. My daughter at the time was maybe six, seven, I don't remember, something like that, right? And she was tired of doing sightseeing. So she's like, mom, can I go home? Sure, no problem. So the doors open. And it's a crowded station, people coming in and out. And she just goes to get off the train to go home. And because she was going to catch a different train and then make her way home. And then we were going on to Shreya. And my sister-in-law freaked out. She's like, you can't let her get off the train. She can't go home by herself. I'm like, sure she can. Like, she does it all the time. And so being in a city, again, is this cultural, um, like, it, this respect for one another and, and anyway kids can travel around the city all by themselves completely safe no problem so these kids are commuting to school um it always just fascinated fascinated me um this is my daughter's a picture of my daughter's school you know they wear the the yellow caps and uh they have the cubbies for the shoes so you come in you change into your indoor shoes you always leave your outdoor shoes you never you know the shoes are always um a big part like when we would have construction or, you know, a repairman or somebody would come to fix something in our house, they would always take such careful um, preparation, lay mats down and remove all their shoes and, you know, just treat everything very cleanly. And they'd wipe down my um, entryway, you know, when they would leave. I mean, just an immense amount of respect and cleanliness. So it, it really is a fascinating place. This is uh, just a picture of my daughter's sports day. I... I'll just play a little bit of it, but I just thought this was kind of a fun way to do the kids in action. It's always fun to have kids. And so this is her uh, preschool. They do a three-year preschool called Yoko And it was from when she was three to five years old. And uh, sports day is always a big event. So they, they do sports days all the way up through high school. And uh, kids will practice and for this big event and stuff. You know, it's always fun to go and just get people. What's interesting too about this is, you know, oftentimes they'll have, you know, even as adults, they'll practice these kind of, you know, cal like calisthenics, like warm up exercises. So if you get up early in the morning and you see a construction, you know, buildings going up or whatnot, and the construction crew will gather, oftentimes in the morning before they start their shift, they will do these kind of exercises together to warm up. So there's there's a lot of uh, focus on preventative health and you know, keeping your body fit. And you know, it's a testament to it. I mean, like right with subways, and they see a little eight-year-old, eight-year-old um, okay, so last couple of things. Um, in Japan, there's a lot of traditional arts. And so one thing that I would recommend that if you go to visit, take part in these, whether it's participating in a craft or cooking or the theater, um, this picture here is a tea ceremony. So you can, you can find a place where you can go and actually participate in, a, in an actual tea ceremony. This top one here is Kabuki. So again, it's a theater, became really popular during that Edo time when the, the samurai you know, ruled from Tokyo. Um, this one down here at the bottom is called No. Um, that's actually my, my favorite. It is the oldest, still practiced theater in the world, if that makes sense. I, I, I never quite know how to say that, but it's still like live and in action, like they're studying it and, and then performing it, but it's the no theater. And then those sweets at the top are special, um, it's called wagashi and it's like special sweets and you can go and you can make them. 
and you can learn in that they'll do, depending on the season you can make them according you know maybe it's a cherry blossom or something if it's cherry blossom season so this list here is just a few examples of things that you can do i brought um no one kabuki or the theater ikebana is the uh flower arranging the tea ceremony washi paper making you can you can um actually make the paper um, there's places that you can go to where they have you make the paper. Hinsugi is, uh, this is just one little thing that I did, but you know, the broken pottery and then they fix it with the gold. You can do that. Um, cooking, making pottery, the Zen meditation we talked about, the Aizome dying. Oh, I forgot to bring that. That's a, the very deep blue. It's a, a leaf that they use. And the, the fishermen used to use it a lot um, to dye their clothes. Um, for their fishing. But anyway, the, it's a deep blue. You can dye and make all sorts of scarves or different things. Um, you can experience kind of a samurai experience um, where they'll show you some of the traditional things a samurai would do. Furoshiki wrapping. Um, you can take a class. Um, these, the furoshiki are the cloths. And so if you remember one of the previous pictures, there was a gift and it was wrapped in a cloth. And I actually use, I, I have a whole bunch of these and we use them for like our Christmas presents and our birthday presents. So I don't use um, uh, wrapping paper. And it's actually a lot faster too, but there's all sorts of different uh, types, but they, they fold them beautifully in all different designs. So you could do a class like that calligraphy and then the wagashi is the sweets that we talked about. So lots of different classes. Um, one last thing, I wanted to sh share something real quick. On, oh, did you want to take a picture of that? I can go back. <laughs> Thank you. Yep, yeah, no problem. The last thing that I mentioned, because I'm a little bit over time here, the last thing I wanted to mention was about the language. If you know that you're going to Japan, um, so in the Japanese language, they have three different types of, we'll say alphabets. It's not really alphabets, but three different types of characters, right? They have hiragana which is this here. These are all phonetic. And then they also have katakana, which match the same sounds, but different symbols. And they use the katakana to use for um, foreign words. So classic example, you know, when I first met my husband and we were dating and he spoke Japanese. And so I, I brought him, you know, to meet my parents and my family's getting to know him. And, and so they're, oh, you speak Japanese. And he's like, yeah, and it happened to be Christmas time. And they're like, well, say something in Japanese. And he's like, say, right? And so he's kind of just standing there and he's meeting my parents and they're throwing all these questions at him, right? So I think my, it was my sister. She said, well, say Merry Christmas, which is kind of a funny thing to ask because that's not very like, you know, it's more of a it's Western just... word, right? But anyway, she said, say Merry Christmas. So he's like, Merry Christmas. And, <laughs> and they're like, what? What's that? And so it... Either they, and they couldn't believe that that was actually Japanese, right? But what it is, is taking the foreign words, so Merry Christmas, and then using the Japanese sounds, using this katakana symbols, right? To adopt, so there's a lot of, like the word for orange is orenji, right? So there's a lot of um, words that you'll start to recognize um, that they just adapted to the Japanese phonetics from the foreign words. The katakana, and then also the hiragana. I mean, if you have a, a couple months before you go, you could easily learn these. These are, they, they're phonetic. They're not too hard to learn if you spend a little bit of time and you'll see them on billboards or signs or different places. And it's kind of fun. Um, I feel like a little kid, like putting a jigsaw puzzle together and I'm trying to read them, right? So you can see them and actually you could pick up a little bit of meaning um, in just some of the signage or things that you see. Um, but these, these are phonetic. So, you know, with a little bit of practice, they're easier to learn. Then there's kanji. And there's thousands <laughs> of these characters. These are derived from the Chinese characters where the character represents, um, you know, a thought and, or meaning. And if you put two characters together, that meaning can even change. The pronunciation in Japanese can change. Sometimes they'll take the kanji and then they'll add the hiragana at the end to conjugate it. And this is where it gets, I mean, Japanese language beyond the characters, this is from my experience as a foreigner, is extremely difficult language to learn. And then you, you add on top of it, the characters, it's, it's, it's quite, it, it, it's very nuanced. But the, the characters, I mean, if you wanted to pursue this, this would be a great lifelong pursuit of study. Yes. I assume that you flow it. 
Did you learn by just living with people or did you go to school or what? For me, I, when I first got there, I took a course. And so for the first year, I studied pretty actively and, and then learned. Then after that, my kids were born and my Japanese kind of didn't do much because I was just scrambling to change diapers and take care of kids. And then once my kids started getting in, my two older boys went to international school. My daughter went to Japanese school. And when my daughter went to Japanese school and I started making a lot more friends with Japanese moms and really getting more in. I mean, I, I had a lot of Japanese friends before, but it was having Japanese friends when my language really had to improve. Um, I, I mean, I, I would love to say I'm fluent, but I, I'm more conversational, uh, you know, because it, it, if you put me into a business setting or even more of a formal setting, I sound like a very rude foreigner because my, my Japanese is very, very direct and very abrupt and kind of blunt. Um, but yeah, I mostly, I think if anybody really wants to learn, um, it's through friends, you know, having that conversation. In fact, a lot of my Japanese teachers would always tell me, you need to get a Japanese boyfriend. That's how you're going to learn. I'm like, but I'm, I'm married. <laughs> so, but it really, it's, it's finding a friend or a close, you know, a partner or somebody that, that you really can dive into the, the nuances. And how women speak and how men speak and how children speak are very different. I mean, it's just the same, I think, in every language, but especially so in Japanese. And there's very, there's lots of different levels. It's very nuanced. Um, so, but still, it, there's even, but I will say, again, like going back to the language, if you're planning to go, if you learn a few phrases and then try to memorize the phonetic characters, even those few phrases that you throw out, you know, Japanese will greet you with a lot of enthusiasm. Oh, you're fluent. You speak Japanese so well. And you may know four or five words, right? But there's, there's a very warm reception to trying to speak the language. So um, this I wanted to show you real fast. So this is an example of the kanji. So this one here says Tokyo. So it's Eastern capital. And so you can see this. One here means capital. So if you go to this one here, that's Kyoto, so capital city. Um, so you, you know, you, if you learn a few, you can start to kind of pick out a few things. I used to tell people I spoke map kanji. Like my my kanji really was all related to maps. Whatever was on the maps, I had to learn to read um, just to navigate and get around. Um, anyway, and then this is konnichiwa. So if you're familiar with, you know, konnichiwa is like the hello, and so these are two different ways of writing. The one on the far side is the phonetic. And so again, you can, if you learn the phonetic, you'll see that often, and then you can pick up a few words. So it really will enhance your travel if you've got a couple of months to prepare and you wanna give it a go. Question, yeah. if you have something like Duolingo, is it gonna be the kanji or is it gonna be one of the others? Like what, what language are they teaching you? Which, where, what do they think is easiest for your, you know, Well, it, well okay. For, like Duolingo is a great resource. Mm -hmm. And one thing you can do on Duolingo is um, you can, it will have the Japanese, but then it will have like the Romanized, the ABC, you know, letters that we know above it so that you can read it. But if you are trying to learn the Japanese phonetic characters, you can switch it so that even if it has the kanji or those characters, above it is these are these phonetic characters. So it'll force you to then still learn the phonetic ones as you try to read the oh, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, so you can, you can, that's why I say Duolingo is a great resource because you can change to either one as you're trying to yeah, learn, learn the language. Problem. Yeah. The books are written in Kanji or the phonetic? Well, the language is a combination. So it's not purely character. So like in Chinese, it's purely characters. In Japanese, it'll be a mix of characters plus the hiragana and the katakana. And so the books will be written with the, the mix. So my daughter, like my, the children's books, will, when they're really young, they won't have any kanji at all, right? It'll be just the phonetics so that they can learn it. And then first grade, they learn certain number of kanji. Second grade, they learn certain number of kanji. Third grade. So then as the books progress throughout school, the, you know, if you're reading a second grade book, 
the, the kanji in that book will only be the first grade and the second grade kanji, if that makes sense. And then they progress that way. So it helps them learn. Um, but yeah, it's a, it, it's a lifelong pursuit. Yeah, please share. We only had spoken language in the beginning. So we adapted Chinese characters from China, but it didn't work with Japanese language. So we developed Hiragana and uh, Katakana for foreign words. So it's, um, in the beginning, children start to learn Hiragana, 50, 50 characters. They are the basic ones to start to learn. I just want to. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that clarification. Thank you. Any other questions on the language? Okay. Well, that pretty much this is just the end. Um, you know, to say thank you for attending. Um, any questions about the presentation or Japan or places to see? Yes, please. Thank you very much for you know covering a lot of things and we learned a lot. And um, I just wanted to ask you. Uh, where was your favorite place? I'm sure that you have visited a lot, a lot of places. Yeah. I it's a long time. Yeah. Um, you know, that's a hard question because I think my favorite places now truly are more because of the people that I go to see. So I, I would say like one of my treasured favorite places would be the Zen temple in Tokyo where my friend lives. And so when I go back to visit, oftentimes she'll let me stay and I'll stay in the temple with them and just be a part of their everyday life and how they operate and get that inside look. Um, but I I mean, for me, I don't know. I love Kyoto. I just, I, I, I could spend years. I told my husband that's where I want to retire just so that I can wander and wander and wander some more and stumble. I feel like every time I go, there's something new that I discover. But I don't know, it's hard because every part of Japan, the north is so different from the south. Um, and so wherever you go, you experience something unique and different. So I, I don't know. I can't, I don't even have a favorite color. So I'm not, I'm not the wrong person to answer the favorite question. I, so many parts have just endeared themselves to me. But the countryside, oh, one, one note that I will say is um, there's a few um, like pilgrimages, you know, or hikes, like there's old roads that used to connect Tokyo and Johto and traveling along those and hiking like the Naka Sendo or different ones. I don't know, those are always fun too, because you experience all these little old towns where you can just feel the history as you travel from town to town. So I don't know, there's lots of places. What made you decide to come back here? Do you have a job um, watch? Kids. My husband's job transferred us here, but um, my kids had only grown up. They were all born in Japan, and that's what they knew. And my boys were getting into high school, and I just felt, you know, they need to experience their home culture and being in the U.S. And so we thought it was the right time for them to come and experience that. So, but, uh, yeah, no, I... I Hope to go back, you know, and live again. Spanish reverse culture shock. Yeah, I even when I would come for the summers, um, I think the biggest reverse culture shock for me is every time you know I board the plane in Tokyo and the airports are quiet, neat, orderly, you know, very organized. <laughs> and then that first, usually I have to transfer, right? So coming, we we usually visit my parents in the, in, in Utah in the west, and so we'd either come through Seattle or San Francisco or LA, right? And it was that first transfer, you get off of the plane, and it was like somebody took the volume and just cranked it up, and I'm like, oh, it's so noisy here. So, you know, just things like, like that. But uh, now I feel like we're kind of, I don't know, sometimes I feel like we're used to a little bit in no man's land too, because in, in Japan, I feel very American. I, you know, my friends walk and tell me, oh, that's so American, oh, you're so American, right? But then when I would come to the States, I'm like, Japanese, you know, just because of the just mannerisms or maybe way of thinking or whatnot, and a little bit of this kind of no man's land. But yeah, can you talk about some of the things to see in Kyoto? Yeah, so I kind of mentioned the uh, the temples. So there's some beautiful from 
You could start at Kiyomizudera. That's a great one to visit. And then from there, there's a huge hill that you walk up to get to that temple. Um, but as you walk down that hill, then there's a little road off to the side, and there's all this cute little shopping and everything that you can go down. And then there's um, Kodaiji Temple, and there's another temple. The name slips my mind, a smaller one across the street. But that little walk, there's is a great walk plus those two temples. But it's but they're, you know, it's one of those things that they are the highlights on the tourist itinerary. Every itinerary you look at will have those. But you know, in some places you can go and avoid the tourist crowds, but they're so worth going to see that you kind of need to just go with the crowd, right? Um, another great place in Kyoto I love is uh, Fushimi Inari Shrine. It's it's more south, um, and it's it's the one. It's got all the twenty gates lined up, all the red gates, and you can just walk and walk. There's a hike that takes you to the top of the sort of little mountain hill there, and it's all these. I mean, there's probably thousands of those of those gates. Um, the castle in Kyoto too. I didn't mention it today, but I really like the castle. The Nijojo is the is the castle. Um, I think one of my I don't know why I like it so much, but um, actually I think my favorite temple in Kyoto is uh, Kenenji, which is near the Gion district. Again, it's a popular tourist spot. Um, it is the oldest Zen temple in in Kyoto. Um, but it's if you go into the main worship hall and you look above, it's got these beautiful painting of dragons. Um, so it's really, it's quite cool. Um, and then a big temple, but a little bit out of the way, a lot of people don't go to is Tofu Kuchi. And again, it's like Tofu and then Tofu Kuchi. I don't know why I like that one so much, but as you come into it, there's sort of this bridge. And, then, and it's kind of up on a hill, and there's a little bit of a gorge with the river down below. It's it's pretty, and it's quiet. It's a little bit more off the track. So, it, But if you're planning an itinerary to Kyoto, hit three or four of the big ones, and then just do some research on some out-of-the-way ones that, that don't get a lot of press. You won't be disappointed. They're all Every one that I go to is unique and different in its own right. But if you find some that are not on that main list, then they'll be your you know, quiet, serene, kind of enjoy the moment a little bit more. Yeah. So, strange question. Is there any real point in the negativity in regard to Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Did you find that? No, that's an interesting question. And I often have people ask me that. Okay. And the answer is absolutely not. I, I only have met one. Person in all of my years, he was an older gentleman that, that had some pretty hard feelings. Um, but I don't know, maybe you guys correct me if I'm wrong here, but interesting question. Well, um, I worked in Australia, mm -hmm. and this man hated me because of the war experience. They, he told me that, well, Japanese soldiers treated us bad, blah, blah, blah. Um, so that kind of feeling carried on among some people. But I saw this documentary and in where the, those American pilots who dropped atomic bomb visited Hiroshima and met those victims. And what they said was, thank you for coming. And that's our attitude. Forgive and go on. Yeah. And, and I would say that that is exactly how you feel um you know there's japan and america have such a strong alliance um and you'll feel that americans when they come to visit are very welcome very um you know want to you know speak english with you um the average japanese know a lot about world events and world politics so they'll want to talk about events and things with you um, they're very excited and curious to connect with foreigners and make friendships. So, no, I've not felt that at all. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to ask about the geographic, lack of a term, extremes. So there's Hokkaido up north, yep. so Okinawa in the south, yep. and then there's Tsushima Island between Japan and Korea. Did you get to visit any of them? And if so, what were they like? Yeah, good question. Long question. <laughs> 
So my one of my very dear friends, we call her kind of our Japanese grandma. She's kind of the Japanese grandma to my kids. The most northern tip of Hokkaido, there's a place called Wakadai, and then there's two little itty bitty islands off the coast there named uh, one is Vichy and the other is Debu. She's from Vichy, which is known, it's famous for the kombu, which is a really thick kelp seaweed. Um, and we went and visited um, her family there. And Hokkaido is, it's got a totally different feel from the rest of um, Japan. It's, it's, and even a lot of times when I meet people from Hokkaido, they've got a little bit different personality um, than I think the rest of Japan kind of open. I don't know, it's hard to explain a little bit, but Hokkaido is, it's so big that it's, it's, it's not, you, when you think of Japan, at least sometimes I do, you know, these cities where it's cramped and tucked and people are all squished together, right? There it's like bigger homes and wide open spaces and mountain ranges and just beautiful um, place, beautiful nature, pristine nature. Um, when you come down through the north, um, and once you're on the main island of Honshu, you know, the northern culture, the north is, there's a lot of snow and the climate is much more harsh so you get um kind of this i don't know at least the people that i've met from that area are kind of party they roll up your sleeves you've got to survive the winter you know kind of you know way then you kind of come down into you know you got tokyo kyoto and osaka but you've got the mountains um i don't know when you go down all the way to the south especially when you get to okinawa it seems much like that kind of that beach a little bit more relaxed um i love meeting like old fishermen you know they love to tell you tales of just whatever so like in okinawa i find that whenever i get into a cab it's usually an older gentleman and kind of, he's just so happy to just share story after story you know i don't know but as you go every region is different and unique and the thing about Japan is each region is usually famous for something, some kind of delicacy, some kind of food, some kind of, um, I don't know, something craft, like a art or craft, you know, but something to make that region unique. And so even though you know, the country itself, compared to the states, is not that big, but every little region that you go to and every little town will have something unique and new and like oh that's interesting i didn't know that so i don't know maybe that doesn't answer your question but um it's, it's a very broad diverse um yeah from north to south it's, it's quite different but a lot of similarities too thank you any, any other yeah um is there any sports attractions that a child who is easily distracted with joy oh Let's see, what kind of things do you like to do? Um, oh, that'd be cool. Um, yeah, there's there's loads of let's see. I, I mean when I when my kids were young, they may not be on the on the on the tourist list of things to do, but there's loads of uh, parks and these beautiful big parks. So the one that comes to mind is outside of Tokyo. And it's enormous. We would be big. when you go there, you can rent bikes even to bike around the whole park. But in within the park, they have all these different areas. Um, they're like there's like a kind of a dragon's land with the mist, and then they have this trampoline part with these big white mounds, and you can bounce on them. They're like bouncing trampolines. So there's lots of things for kids to do, and it, it is actually a very kid friendly place to go. Um, one thing I'll say, I mean, if you're kind of dragging them along, you know, going to all the things that you want to see, um, there's convenience stores and um, uh, like to find food or snacks along the way, it's super easy. And people generally, they really like kids. And so you're not going to find, you'll be in a lot of places where people are like, oh, keep your kid quiet. I mean, they're very welcoming. And um, I really didn't have a problem with my kids. There was only maybe a couple times, um, you know, maybe the older ladies on the train would tell me to keep my kids quiet and off the seats. <laughs> but usually they're very, very welcoming for kids. So I think you could, you know, you just go to slower, slower pace, but.
from the sides of the castles, the temples, and other attractions, are there any museums that are worth to visit um, in Japan? Yeah, there's loads of museums. Um, really, I can mostly speak to Tokyo because those are the ones that I know um, the best. Um, in Tokyo, they have a museum called the Edo Museum. And it will take you back to kind of that Edo samurai time. And there's, a, again, that would be a great one for kids too, because there's a lot of hands on displays and different things to see. But it really explains the history back. Uh, you know, you get it, you feel like you walk back in time. Because they have a lot of um, actual displays of what a house would look like, or what the, you know, just the, I don't know like how a market would look like, you know, those kinds of things, their actual physical displays. Um, that's a good one. Another one that I really like, you know, the, the Kanagawa Way, you know, the art, um, it's quite popular. Um, it's like a picture of a big wave. Hokusai is the artist, and near that Edo Museum, there's actually a Hokusai Museum, and I, I would highly recommend that one because of a lot of his works, and he's, he's fantastic. So, um, and, and, and that museum too, um, you get to see, you know, you've probably heard of Japanese woodblock prints, so it'll show you how the, the process of how the woodblock prints are made. Um, but then also the Ueno up in that area, there's loads of different museums to go see. Uh, you might know, it's called, yeah, in Tokyo, U-E-N-O. In the old part of the city, exactly. And there's lots of different types of museums, so you can find something that you would enjoy, um, but definitely yeah, lots of great museums. And, and you, if, I, if you're looking for something in particular, there's a lot of smaller museums too that will showcase maybe a type of calligraphy or a type of painting or different museums. So. We do one more, and then we probably run out of time. Yeah, one more. I was trying to uh, stay three or four days. And didn't want to move around because of the kids. Mm -hmm. What area in Tokyo did you? I mean, I want to just pick one area and then I can see others, even though it's a good transportation, but I just want to see if you have any recommendation. Yeah. Um, really, I, I mean, any, I would say what you really need to look for is does your hotel have easy access? to either the subway or the train line. Because if you're going to see different things, I mean, if you're in the city, inevitably you're going to end up in different parts seeing different things. But if your hotel has convenient access to, like I said, either the metro or the, or the train lines, then it's really easy to get around. Um, what you want to avoid is if you've got little ones and you've got a hotel and you've got to walk 10 minutes to get to the, the the train line and it makes it a little bit more inconvenient um but in terms of a nice central place to stay i mean i you'll find a lot of things in that shibuya harajuku area there's lots of you know just right on the outskirts of that or maybe towards the old city you know in the shitamachi area up in ueno asakusa because there's a lot of things to do in that area as well so maybe look in those two areas Thank you, everybody. I really, again, I really appreciate everybody coming and listening to me.